notes. Uh, we're going to be in James chapter 4, James chapter 4. Um, I heard this statement today, and I think it applies uh, very, very closely to our scripture. There is no growth when you are comfortable. Right? There is no growth when you are comfortable. And I say that, and, and while there, there can be some measurable growth, the, the growth that's sustaining, the growth that's life-giving, the growth that when things get really hard and difficult that's necessary for life, like it, it requires uh, times of, 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 of stress. It requires um, you know, uh, some you know, deep evaluation, all that sort of stuff. And just to kind of share a little bit about this is that you know, every time that they go and they plant corn up in the north, um, they would plant corn, and usually they would plant it uh, in springtime, and the corn would shoot up fairly quick so it could start to grow. Uh, and then there's kind of a dip in rain, and, and then it just starts to get fairly dry. And as a result of the stress that's put on the plant, uh, the roots are required to grow down deeper. Right? And as they grow down deeper, now we get to see a plant is, is capable of withstanding some of the big storms that come in the summer uh, because of the fact that they were uncomfortable through the, through the season of the sun and the season of dryness uh, ultimately gave them strength in the season of the storms and eventually bring to a place where they can produce great fruit. So today, I'm going to make sure that we stay rather uncomfortable um, mostly, well, the Scripture's going to leave us in that place. Uh, we're all going to find ourselves in it, um, and it's going to be challenging. As we go through the book of James, uh, James is a heavy hitter, right? We know that he is teaching to Jewish Christians, so uh, these would be people that, 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 that have chosen to serve the Lord, and, and he's getting into a very practical section of Scripture uh, right now, the last few times we've gone through the book of James, uh, he kind of really hit us really heavily on our words, right? He said, you know, essentially, like, <laughs> your words are like, you know, they really matter. You can set an entire forest on fire with just a small little spark, and that's like what the tongue looks like. And then he'd follow it up with kind of, not only do your words matter, but your actions are going to matter. But you can't be hypocritical. There can be a, a sense that you put on display a person, uh, but it's not real. And, and he's, he's challenging. You can't be that way. Like You have to be, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, someone who is, who is the same on the inside as they are on the outside. And now he's going to really strike heavy at, the very, at our very heart. And we're going to be in James chapter 4. I'm going to do the first four verses a little differently than I normally do. I'm going to read from the New King James, and then I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Okay, we don't need to put that up just yet, Amy. You're okay. Um, and so I'm going to read from there, and then I'm going to jump over. And the only reason I'm going to do the first four verses like this is because it, it adds some, some flavor and some clarity uh, to the words that we find in the New King James. So, so here we are it's, it's in verse 1. It says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? And if you were to read this in the, the New Living Translation, it would say this, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that war within you? So you see this sense of a, of a dichotomy here. Right? He's, he's hitting at the quarreling that's going on amongst, amongst believers, amongst the family. Right? That, that they're, they're at each other, one after another after another. And he's saying, what is the deal with this warring that's going on between you guys? Is this the thing that's happening outside? Is, and then he says, is it, wait a second, isn't it just, don't they come from the evil desires that war from within you? Right, that every bit of the quarreling and the anger and the strife that can happen, you know, whether it's in a church, whether it's in a family, whether it's at your workplace, all those sorts of things have a root. Right? They've got a source in which they're going to bring forth their fruit. Right? And he says it's, it's within you. Right? That's the, the part. It's, it's going to be the, the evil desires or the pleasure um, of, this, of this world. That word evil desire or pleasure is, is hedano, 
Okay, this is where you would get the word hedonism, right? And if you've ever heard of hedonism, a lot of times they, they apply this to kind of a food and eating experience where you just kind of, just, it just keeps rolling in, right? It's a seven-course meal, and you stuff yourself to the brim. And back in the day when you had hedonists, and the idea of a hedonist is that their entire course of philosophy was to seek out pleasure um, and self-indulgence, right? And so you had all kinds of philosophies, especially back in the days of the Greeks and the Romans, and you'd have like the Stoics who just needed to be, you know, super down and, and just, just strip everything away from their life. And then you'd have the hedonists who are just full on seeking all the pleasures of life. And part of what they would do is, is they'd have these massive parties with massive amounts of food, and they would gorge themselves to the point in which they're so full, so just, just worn out, and then they would go throw it up so that they could go right back and do it again. And they would continue to do this. And that was the idea, just a, a constant self-indulgence of, of what would satisfy a person's you know, deepest, de- <laughs> their desires. And saying all of the warring that goes amongst us, family, church, is going to be because of that desire that's in us. It's interesting because wouldn't, we, wouldn't you want to say, well, it's, a, it's the enemy at work in this world, Right, you know, providing and tempting and hanging carrots and, and causing immense strife within a marriage. And sometimes you look at it, it's like, you know, people are like, it's, it, you know, this massive spiritual warfare. I can't say that the, the enemy is not going to be dangling a car- carrot to get you guys to go like this. But you know what? Why do you go like this? It's not because the enemy's dangling a carrot. It's because you got evil desires in your heart is what he's saying. That's the real source and that's the real issue and that's the real problem of man is it all starts right there, the evil desires that are at war within you. And he's talking to Christians. What is the war that is going on? Right There's, there's a war, and what he'll say here is, of the things in which you want but you don't have. That's where the war is going on and reason why these, these selfish desires and pleasures start to overwhelm and overtake us. This is different than the war that he talks about, about the, the war of the flesh and the spirit. While that's a war as well, right, where we're constantly at a battle between the things of this world and then the things of the spirit, and, and, and we're, we're kind of like, what do I do? And, and I, I just, it, there's a part of that, but, but the real war that happens that causes this strife is the fact that, well, look in verse 2, it says, you lust and you do not have. You murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. As the New Living Translation would say, it would say it like this. You want what you don't have. So you scheme and you kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. You don't have what you don't want because you don't ask God for it. You can see the clarity there. But the reason why there's this warring is that you want what somebody else has. right? And so therefore, you get this, this jealous spirit, this, this, this attitude of jealousy that just, just starts to birth inside of you. You start to have a sense of, of coveting what somebody else might have. And so you start to hate him, right? When he says murder, I mean, in some cases, people do really cross the line. But we know that Jesus would have said, hey, listen, if you harbor you know, hatred in your heart or say raka towards your brother, it's just like murder. And, it, and all those sorts of things have its birthplace in a point of, of I want what I just don't have. And you continue to take that back and you roll it back. This goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. This was, was the, the, the basis of the original sin, the original workings of the enemy to entice um, Eve to, to sin. He says, you know, God's keeping something from you. Really? Did he really say that that's going to happen? You don't, you, you know, like when you take of that fruit, like, you're going to be like God. 
that you're going to have so much knowledge of good and of evil and all those things. God's holding back on you, and he's, he's clearly keeping it all maybe for himself in that scenario. But in ours, we look around, and it's easy to find a place of, of coveting what somebody else might have. And as a result of that, it starts to stir up in us kind of an evil desire. You know, it could be things, especially in this scenario, like you've got this, um, you know, the things in which you don't have. You can easily look at things like, like, a money, like money, you know, or a house. Like, why do they have, why do they have such good things? Right, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just barely getting by. The car just clunks along, and, and all those sorts of things. And but they have, they have so much more. And then you can look at family members, right? And family members that you know that that they live as heathen as they come. They could care less that God has done anything in this world. They're angry. They're, they're bitter. They're drunks. They're all those sorts of things. And for whatever reason, it's like God has just blessed them with 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 all this mountain of stuff, and you're just struggling to get along. You see that stirring of jealousy. Why is it that those things happen to other people? I guess they just got a new job and a promotion. Why didn't they pick me? I mean, come on, like I see how hard that guy works versus me. I see what they do instead of, you know, I mean, versus me. I like they they, they don't even have a degree that I have. There's all kinds of things that start to stir up in us a sense of jealousy which starts to build bitterness, which starts to build strife. The real problem, though, is when it starts to get closer and closer to home. It can be close in this body, you know, where you can look around and you'd be like, especially if you're single, like there could be a sense of like, man, they've got, they've got so much going for them. And there could be an opportunity to covet. Or looking at a marriage that might be struggling. It's like, why, do, why is my marriage struggling and theirs is not? And you can go back and forth with all a sense of, of unfairness. And what does that do? It's that covetousness that starts to rise up in a sense of evil desire. And he says, you know what? You're going to do whatever you can to do that. To go get what you don't have. And so you start to find that you start to cross lines that you never should cross in order to get a little bit of pleasure, a little bit of satisfaction, maybe move the needle down a, a pathway which you think you ought to go. And, and all of the while, it's just, it's like you still don't have what you really want. You've got all of this stuff. You know, it's, it's funny too, like I, I look at, this has happened a couple times with, even like with my, with my business. Some people will come up to me, uh, and they'll say, wow, it just seems like it was an overnight success. I'm like, you don't have a clue, all the things that went down. It's like, you're just so lucky. So you know what kind of happens? The harder I work, the luckier I get. But in reality is, is that, and this is just something that's super critical. You do 100% of everything that God has laid before you to do, and you do it 100% well. You finish the task, you complete your things, and you let God have the results after that. And I mean, these are the things that you start, you know, you, people kind of start to push you off as, as, as whatever that is. And, and in the church, this can cause so much strife. And we have to be so careful not to allow ourselves to become embittered as we might see someone get, someone else get an opportunity that we don't get. Or maybe somebody else is, is you're seeing the hand of God work in their life. And you're like, oh, did you forget about me? No, there's a reason why we do these just one more stories, and it's not for you to say, oh, God, did you forget about me? I haven't had one in a month. No, to remind you that God is working in so many different people's lives, and he's continuing to work in their lives and your life. Right? That's the blessing of what all of that looks like. <laughs> and he says, you know, you're even willing to steal it. You're willing to steal it, to, to, to just take it from people. And you think about this. What are some other things that we can struggle with? Peace. Have you been around family members or, or people that for whatever reason, they're so angry and so miserable, and you walk in the room or you pick up the phone and you have peace in your life and you've got, a, you've got a, you know, just a sense of joy, and it's almost like it's a heat-seeking missile to take that joy away from you, to steal every ounce of the peace because they don't have it. You've been there, and that's where does that come from? It comes from 
inside the selfish nature of all of those things. And he says, you know what? You want to know why you don't have those things? Because you, you don't ask God for them. Now, it's not necessary. And you got to be, we got to be careful with this verse. Because a lot of times, people are going to take this way, 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 way out of context. Right? You, you, you don't have because you don't ask. And so, so therefore, it's kind of like, well, if you just ask, then instantly, boom, poof, there it is. But we're not going to take it out of context. We're going to understand and read it as it is. Here, he's saying, you want all these things? You're going about it all the wrong way. That's what he's saying. Right? If you really, really, really wanted to have a sense of peace, then, then, then maybe you should go to the Lord for that rather than trying to steal it from somebody else through your bitterness, anger, rage, whatever that might be. There's a, there's a better pathway here than going down the same routes that, that you've always done. And, and so you, you don't have these things because you, you're not even approaching the Lord. But not only that... And he goes on, and it says here in, in verse 3, it says, You ask, and you do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your own pleasures. The New Living Translation would say it like this. He says, And even when you ask, you don't get it, because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. And so here's where we get the context. Right? And it gives us a little bit of a tool to see how prayers are, are being able to be answered according to God's plan and God's purpose. <laughs> okay, you don't ask. You're not approaching God at all for these things. You're, he's, 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 not, he's not giving it to you. You're trying to steal them. But when, it kind of the idea is, but when you do ask him, right? When you do say, well, God, I, I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I need this promotion. It's got to be there. Or I, I, I gotta have a, a, a car, or I've, I've gotta have some sense of like peace, or I need, a, uh, I need a friend, or you can pick all these sorts of things, you just plop it out there. Um, but the motive is all off. Why do you want that? Well, because you're gonna wanna spend the money on yourself, right? Why do you want that? Because you wanna look great in that new car. Why do you want that? Well, because you're lonely, and, and, and <laughs> you think that if that, that man or woman is gonna be able to satisfy that portion of your life, then then, then that's going to be everything that you need. And you're asking a miss. Why? Because if God were to give it to you, he understands the heart and he understands the motive. And so if he gives that to you, you're going to spend it on your own pleasure. And so when you ask, you're asking a miss. Like there's a target of God's, God's will and God's heart and God's desire, right, for, for your life and his bigger purpose. And you're, and you're, and you're sitting there and you're like, I I want this for myself. You may not say it. You won't say it. You won't even think about it. But the reality of it is, is that he understands the inner motives of our heart. And what does this do? This leads us down a path to understand how God is working with prayer, right? Many times we think prayer is, is like getting, you know, getting God to move his hand in our life. It's like he's a genie. Rather than, he should get us to move on his behalf. That should be a much stronger desire for prayer. Right? Move us on your behalf. Move us in action and sharing our faith. Move us in, in, in you know, giving of our time, energy, resources. Move me, God, so that I might be able to do your will. Or move me in such a way, especially if you're, you, know, you, you can't reach out to a loved one or a family member because the door's been shut. Move me to pray according to your will. God, I need you to move me. Rather than move the circumstances so it might coordinate towards my special pleasures. It's kind of hitting them straight right there. And that's the problem. And then people get angry at God because he doesn't provide something for them, right, that they thought was necessary and they thought they would need uh, to be able to get something special for their life put together. Now look at verse 4. It says, adulterers and adulteresses. There's an exclamation mark. It's pretty heavy. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. In the New Living Translation, it says, you adulterers. 
Right? The, the, the concept is, is that, you know what? You're playing the game. Right? You're playing both sides here. You're trying yourself to be able to have a, you know, a, a relationship with God, but you're, you're, you're playing with all the, the gods of this world. You're an adulterer. You, that, is, that is exactly how, how James throws it out. That's a pretty heavy indictment, isn't it? Right? And, and this is kind of, you know, could you, if somebody were to call you an adulterer, right, to your face outside of a context of, hey, I get to be your pastor tonight, and I get you adulterers, right? <laughs> Wait a second, right? You touched, you, you just called me what? Right? You don't know my life. You don't know me. But what's just happened here is, is that he's just, the reason why this is uncomfortable is because we're all indicted on the very fact that we play both sides of the ball. In our natural heart, we're playing on the side of, of the Lord all the while, hoping that, that it's going to be for us. And we can miss him. He says, yeah, you adulterers, do you understand this, this, this mind that's of the world and this mind that's of, of the spirit? Like, you can't have both. Those things are a problem. And he would go on, he says, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? And I love this little paraphrase in the New Living Translation. He says, and I say it again. Because he essentially says it twice. Um, he says, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Like, there's, there's, no, there's no, no ways. Like, you know, when adultery happens in a home, right, that's like instant enemy territory. Right? Instant enemy territory. And it's heartbreaking. Right? And it's destructive. Now, now you kind of step back and it's like, okay. Like, and, and, and we can understand and we can imagine if we allow ourselves to go there. And some of you guys have been there and, and in positions on both sides. It's just, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, the enemy of a spouse who has been scorned and shamed because of adultery is awful. But could you imagine now being an enemy of God? I mean, an enemy of God who chose to go to the cross for you and for me, who was scourged 39 times like we talked about this weekend, and just to kind of play the game. You know, oh, it's just a, it's just a conversation with the world. It's just choosing to allow things to come into my mind that I'm listening on the radio or I'm watching on TV. It's like, it's, it's just not too bad. And it starts to do that. What, what line is in a, a relationship with the opposite sex of two people that are married inappropriate? I mean, where is that line drawn? And that's, that's, what he's, that's what he's getting at, right? And, and, and James is being very, very pointed and fierce with that point. Where's the line drawn? You know, <laughs> if, if you're going to be wise, like, if this is the line, you stay so far away from that line, it's not even... Close. Conversation too long, a text message that shouldn't be there. I mean, all those things should never happen. And so he's saying the same thing is with the world. The same thing with the world because it's one step after another after another, and then you've crossed a really, really serious line. He says, you make yourself an enemy with God. <laughs> you like having enemies? Anybody like having enemies? You know, the only time I like having an enemy is if I know I can beat them, right? If I know I can beat them, then I'm okay. You know, it's, it's kind of a, a, an interesting game. It's a fun game. It's not like the time when I played football. Remember, we played this team, Fowler. They were third in state. They had this running back that was number one. And uh, he rushed the ball five times. And we had a small team. We had, we had 13 kids playing 11-man football. They had 50. And uh, he, he touched the ball five times, scored five touchdowns, had 250 yards. And uh, we had a, a guy get hurt in the first quarter and the second quarter, and it was a rough day. <laughs> we got to play varsity football with a bunch of freshmen on either side of the ball after that. You know what? You don't like those games. Nobody wants to play with someone who's just going to utterly crush and destroy you. Now let's make God our enemy. Are you going to ever score on him? 
Are you ever going to get anywhere there? Not a chance. And so Jesus is like, you got it. This is the problem with our heart. This is why there's this warring that's going on. It's got to stop. You're making yourself a, a friend of, of the world. You're going to make yourself an enemy with God. You can't have both. You can't have two friends in this scenario. You're either a friend or an enemy to one or the other. If you're going to be a friend of God, I guarantee you're going to be an enemy of the world. But that is a much better side to be on. If I could have played that game over, I would have rather put a Fowler uniform on than a Cripple Creek Victor High School uniform on. That's for sure. I would much rather be on that side. (laughs) And he talks about this worldly kind of heart that's there. And just this back and forth on it. And it's, you know, it's one of those deals where it doesn't just start by like jumping off a cliff and getting strung out on heroin or meth. You know, I mean, you're not going to just go, you know, rob a bank tomorrow because you need a little bit extra cash. Like, these things are progressive. And so that's why he's drawing such a, a fierce line in the sand, right? Our, our worldly heart starts with, you know, and I'm using adultery as the example, it starts with a conversation. It starts with a look. It starts with moving a little bit closer into that reality until you end up into a place where it's just broken. And it would be so much better if it stopped as soon as possible. And so the challenge is, and what James is challenging us with, is that, you know what, if you're playing games with the world, you're going to find that you've got an enemy of God. Your enemy is God. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you will be so radically miserable every time you move down that path. Every time you get closer and closer, engage with the things of this world, it will be more and more miserable. It will be more difficult within your own heart, with your own spirit. Right? You, could be, you could be raking in as much as you, your cash as you ever could dream of and all that sort of stuff, but there would be a deadness, and I think the Lord will guarantee that out of his goodness and grace and say, you know what? At some point, how has it been being my enemy? He would say this in verse 5. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealous, jealousy. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. He says this. Do you think that the Bible is going to tell us just, just because it's, it's, you know, it's fun? That, this, that, that God is jealous for us? You know, we hear that word, and I mean, you know, if, you, if you listen to Oprah Winfrey's story, that's the reason why she left the church, that she found out God is a jealous God. And so she's like, I can't imagine having a jealous God. And so therefore she left. But she didn't hear the realities of it. You know, when I think about that, you know, I think about my own wife, and I would say that I'm jealous for her. I'm not jealous in this controlling overbearing, don't you talk to people sort of manner. I'm jealous for her heart. I'm jealous for her soul. Like I want her to be able to experience every single thing that God has in store for her life so that she might be able to be used by God to the very day she hears, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And I'm jealous. So anything that's going to come in and is going to start to pull away at that opportunity, Like, you better believe that I better stand in the way and say, hey, this is not okay. This is my wife. I'm going to protect her. I'm going to keep her safe. I'm going to keep moving down in that direction. And that's what it looks like to have a godly sense and understanding of jealousy. She's jealous for you. He he, he loves you. He has a a plan and a purpose. And he he desires a certain thing for your life. And and when you play games with the world, he's just like, the Spirit of God is like, Jealous, I love you. What do you do with all this? I'm glad it doesn't end there. Verse 6, but he gives more grace. He gives well, how much? He gives more grace. The idea is that you have grace, and then you've got more grace. 
Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know, when you understand grace, it's, it's, the, it's, it's basically to, to, to give a gift to someone which they don't deserve. You don't deserve it at all. Like there's, there's no capacity, and it's different than mercy. And we, we love the idea of mercy, but you know what mercy does as it relates to our relationship with God is mercy pulls the judgment off of our, off of our head. Right? We, we now get to no longer face the judgment for our sin because God has been merciful uh, on our soul. Right? So, so mercy has come in. And if it was simply mercy that we had, yeah, we would have a, a blessed peace that our soul is secure and our soul is saved. But there's this other word that he uses throughout the scripture. It's not just mercy, but now we get to see that it's going to be grace. And what does grace do? Grace doesn't just, just not let something happen, but grace now gives. It gives something in which none of us deserve at all. In light of the wickedness of our soul, in light of our constant wrangling and playing games with the world and trying to please God and being an enemy of God and being you know, a friend of the world, all those sorts of things, he says, I'm going to give you more grace. I'm going to give you something that you clearly do not deserve. And what is that grace? That grace is going to be, it's going to be the gift of the Holy Spirit is one of the graces, right? That you now have, a, have an intimate relationship with God the Father through the person of the Holy Spirit, right? That he's going to, he's going to give you grace when it comes to power, when you share the gospel and, and when, you, when you live out your life. He's going to give you grace to overcome the world, just as Jesus overcame the world. That's a gift. All those things have now been given to us in Christ as he imparts that grace to us. You think about Paul and, and, you know, and it's just kind of the situation he was in and, and how do we kind of almost get more grace, like the idea of more grace. Would you, who would like to have more grace? I want more grace. I clearly need more grace. How do I get more grace and more grace? The, the implication here is, is that there's, and, and it's kind of interesting because you want to just assume like, hey, once you have God's love, it's like you always have all of God's love. But when he uses the word more grace, right, there's this concept that we get to experience the blessing of an increasing amount of grace, right? And Paul understood this. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says this, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So he says, listen, he was in such a position because God has given him such revelation of the scripture that that people would put him in this special place of honor, right? Without question, you couldn't help it because Paul was so incredibly gifted with all of this stuff. Right? He was obviously given gifts of power for healing. I mean, all kinds of things were given um, and, and demonstrated by Paul as he walked out his ministry. But he was given this, this uh, thorn in the flesh so that he wouldn't be exalted. Verse 8, he says, Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in what? In weakness. He was given something that made him weak. We don't know what it was. It seems to be some physical ailment. It doesn't matter. But you see, in that sense of weakness, Paul found out God's amazing grace. His infinite grace, not just grace unto salvation, but grace unto life. He says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities or in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, weaknesses, in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Or how about given more grace? And that's why when, he, when we read this in verse 6, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Right? In this whole thing, 
If you want more grace, then you have to find yourself to be so weak. You recognize that your heart is at war with every bit of your being. Right? That you're, there's just constant war that's going on. God, I have no capacity to win this war. I am so weak. I'm such a mess. And at that moment, you find that God's grace becomes greater. Doesn't it? There's more grace now applied to you so that you can bear from all of those weaknesses that you have. And Paul found out the closer he walked with the Lord, how weak and pitiful he really was. That is an amazing sign of spiritual maturity, as an absolute dependence that I am nothing without Jesus Christ. And the more we recognize that, that we can do no good in our, and of our own selves, that we have no real strength outside of the very gifts that God has graced us with, will be the very moment we get to experience more grace. And the grace to also win the battle from within. That's warring within our members. And so he shares this with us. He goes on verse 7. He says, therefore, submit to God. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Right? He starts out and he says, listen, you, you submit to God. You now have a capacity to submit to God. Uh, but you don't have a clue. Like, I, I, I have to do these things. Like, I just, I can't help it. It's just, just no, now if you've, if you've been given a gift of grace, given, given the Holy Spirit, then you have a capacity to, to operate in one of the fruits of that spirit, and that's self-control. I can submit myself to God. Place myself under. And when you place yourself under, you admit your weakness, and there's a blessing with that. That now you get to experience more grace. <laughs> and then he says you can resist the devil. Right? Resist the devil. He will flee from you. you know, the, the concept here, and we've got to be a little like, careful with this sort of stuff. You know, when it says the devil, it's kind of, it, it, the emphasis is really kind of more evil in general. You know, some people will be like, man, Satan was knocking on my door. Like, think about it. Satan is the most powerful, demonic, angelic being in the entire, you know, creation. He's probably not the one assigned to knock on your door, right? I mean, even Daniel uh, was, was not given Satan, right? He was given the, the prince of Persia, right? I mean, and so it, it's probably not specifically Satan. But you can't deny the fact that there are, are true uh, spiritual workings that are, that are going to be working in a home and working in a family. Sometimes when there starts to become strife, we have to step back and say, listen, you know what? Like, it sure feels like, like the enemy is stirring up these evil passions within us to get angry and upset because I want what I want and you want what you want and we just do this. Let's go ahead and let's not allow the, the enemy to win by enticing these things. Let's step back, recognize it for what it is, and let's just uh, invite the Lord to come on into this conversation, heated conversation, spirited conversation. Those are better words to use in the home, right? You talk with somebody doing cancer. Well, we had a spirit, spirited conversation last week. And, um, you know, said a few things that maybe wouldn't quite pass muster. Okay. But... That's the thing. Invite the Lord into it. The moment that you invite the Lord into any place where the enemy is working, it's, oh, it's done. Right? And now you have been given. Is that a grace? Is that a gift that you don't deserve? Absolutely. And it's a blessing which we have when, when we invite the work of the Lord into our life. Verse 8. We say this. He says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. What a grace that is. You understand? Like the righteous God of all mankind, all of the world, like he tells you that you can draw near to him. You can come to him. I don't know about you, but there is no way you're going to come to God puffed up and ready to talk to him about something. I got a bone to pick with you, God. No way you're doing that. If you were to approach the holy, righteous, living God, you were probably going to approach him crawling. Like, I am nothing inside of you. I would absolutely have to fall on my face. Like, that's the idea. But as we, we're given a grace, and he says, I want you to just draw near to him. 
And the cool thing is as you draw near to him, you start to experience the blessing of him drawing near to you. Like, you want to have experience the Lord? Like, draw near, dive into the scripture. He's given a capacity for you to experience him. If you draw near, that is a grace, a more of a grace than we ever could possibly deserve. And he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. <laughs> the New Living Translation actually would use double and double-minded. It says, your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Right? He says, cleanse your hands and cleanse your hearts. Right? That, that mindset, that attitude that we end up having where we're, where we're desiring the things of the world and, and also still trying to please God is, is filthy. Right? We've got, we've got our, our hands are dirty because we're doing things we ought not to do, but our hearts are really mess. Right? And, and, and it takes it a step further than, than what all of the, the Jewish Christians would have grown up with and known. Right? Whenever there was a purification ceremony, there was no cleansing of the heart. Right? You would wash your hands. Right? And, and in, in many cases, they'd have these mikvahs, and they were these small little, little pools of water, and, they, and the, the priests would go in, and they would, they would baptize themselves. They would dunk themselves in, and the idea was they would be, their whole body would be cleansed, and then they could walk in uh, and be able to teach and communicate at the synagogue. Right? Clean in the outside. But, and so they would have understood the idea of cleaning hands, before you approach God. But now you've been given a grace that your heart can be cleaned. You can have a clean heart and a clean conscience now because the finished work of Jesus Christ, you no longer have to approach God and draw near to him uh, in, a, in a measure of fear and worry and concern, but rather you can, as Jesus would say, you can call him Abba, Father. Right? Like he's our Father. We can draw near in that regard. He says, so cleanse your hearts. And that cleansing happens by the working and the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that we can approach him in that way and no longer be double-minded, having our loyalty split and divided. And he says this in verse 9 and 10. Well, 9, it says, Lament and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to, to, to gloom. Now, isn't there a contradiction here in the Bible? Doesn't Jesus say, I'm going to give you a joy that no man could ever take from you? And then here James is coming back and say, hey, listen, take that joy and let's turn it to gloom. Well, what kind of Christian life do you want to live? This isn't going to preach very good in any church, right? I want you to come to God totally humble humiliated with your sin and, and the way that you've been playing games with the world. Like, that's what he's saying. I want you to come like that. Just totally worn out. Because what happens? In order for us to be able to experience that, that, that refreshed and renewed relationship, that grace that comes, right, is, is first thing is, is it, takes, it takes a legitimate sense of remorse. That's what he's saying. It's, you got to have some real remorse, if you're trying to build back a relationship and, and you're like, oh, hey, listen, you know, I won't do it again. Sorry, I, I just I didn't think it was bad. That means nothing. You do it just because someone said they don't like it. It takes a sense of brokenness and true remorse to val validate even the next step of, I am so done with playing games with that stuff. That world, I'm so tired of the hurt that I've been causing. I am just broken. I, Lord, I will not, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to turn and go a different way. And out of that, we get to see that there's now, a starts to become a heart of what's known as restitution. The people that I've wronged, I'm going to stop doing that and I'm going to go pay them back. If, I've, if you've broken trust with someone, Right? Because of the things in which you've done. Like now there's this opportunity. You've got to restore it. Right? It's not just a forgiveness and everything's happy and done. No, there's now a sense of you've got to restore and make pay restitution on that which you stole. Right? And it starts with remorse, it starts with repentance, but it's got to finish with restitution. The praise of the Lord that God did all of those for us, but in terms of our own personal life. Right? Well, we've got to make sure we're, we're paying back that which we stole. 
And think about it. Let's say you go rob a bank. You steal all this money. And it's a lot of money. So you got a million dollars. How long is it going to make, is it going to take you to pay back that million dollars if you blew it? <laughs> take a really, really long time, won't it? That's what happens when you take someone's trust and you steal their trust. You steal a bit of their heart. It happens like that. And it might take years to build that back up. But if a person has gone through a process of truly wailing, lamenting, having a heart of brokenness, and those years are worth it. They are absolutely worth it in the end. <laughs> and the thing is, is he doesn't just leave us in this place of gloom. He says this, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he'll lift you up. That's what he says. If you were to stand face to face with God, and, and just confess the things in which you know you've done that have been broke, that you've broken relationships, broken your relationship with him, and you actually humble yourself before him. Here's God's grace. You're a new creation in Christ. I've made you brand new. Just like the woman that was caught in adultery. Go and sin no more, but there's no more accusation against you. What a blessing that is, as we get to have that, that full experience, understanding the brokenness of our heart and just how it wars within us, how we make friends with the world, become enemies with God, but his grace increases as we decrease. What a blessing that is. That's grace. That's grace, and I pray that you understand God's grace better tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we thank you that you can challenge us, that uh, you uh, want us to grow in you and grow in our understanding of you. So, so therefore, we can't be comfortable when we hear, uh, hear your word taught. And I pray that there would be a deeper, firmer understanding of your grace as we understand the scripture today. Lord, do a special work in the hearts of each person here. We love you, Lord, and we praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.